Hi, everybody. Dr. Friedman here, and we are almost to the end of the published novels of Jane Austen in the Austen and Games course. Here in week six, we are now to the posthumously published novels, which are Northanger Abbey and then next week, Persuasion. These books, as my students were surprised to realize, were published together. And as I tried to note to my students quite insistently, the Austen family had options at the end of Austen's life. She also left behind two fragments, which we're going to read later in the semester, as well as one other complete epistolary novel, Lady Susan, none of which the Austen family would publish for well over a century. I compared this to Mary Brunton, who uh, died the same year, was born in the same year as Jane Austen. And Brunton's husband collected all of her unpublished stuff, which was a combination of travel writing and an unfinished but outlined novel, Emmeline, that starts with remarriage after divorce, um, and published the whole thing. So Austen's family had other options, as I've argued in some of my previous published work. But the key with Northanger Abbey uh, is the ways in which it's thinking about the literary marketplace and reading. Most of my students, because we have a fair number of gothic aficionados in the room, already know that Northanger Abbey is a novel about the gothic novel, about the horrid novels that Catherine and her new friend Isabella Thorpe are reading together as part of their bonding. What goes perhaps a little less studied is the way that Austen uses the very critiques of the novel that were coming from other novels, that were coming from the increasingly professionalized reviewing market and other places. She recasts them, reframes them, and uses them as tools to defend and justify the novel as a form. Um, which is a bravura performance, and one we see Austen using as a technique throughout the novel, as we discussed uh, last night. We see this also as she is negotiating, you know, how to think about uh, the ending, how to think about reading, um, how to think about um, what makes a good hero. We talked a lot about Henry Tilney, and we talked a lot about what Tilney knows um, and as our special guest, my collaborator on this channel, Dr. Emily Kugler noted, this is another case, as with most of Austen, where the bad boy and the suitable hero are in some ways kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, one, uh, John Thorpe, a pompous asshole who is a, the quintessential mansplainer, but who knows functionally nothing versus Henry Tilney, who does indeed know things and knows things that one would not expect of him, his knowledge of muslins, which Catherine can't read as straightforward or satirical. She simply cannot figure it out. What she will ultimately discover is that he has a good heart, um, even as she is kind of discovering all of the ways in which she's been misreading the larger scenario. But as I wanted to argue to students, um, Catherine Moreland is not wrong in essentials, she's wrong in accidentals. Uh, she is often a misreader of the facts and evidence, right? Her imagination gets away with her from her. But at the core of things, the emotional truth, for example, that General Tilney is a total dick, she is getting right. He may not be monstrous in precisely the way that she thinks he is, but, you know, he's still a monster. Emily was here to talk about the piece that she and I co-wrote for Persuasion's um, special issue on uh, Beyond the Bit of Ivory, Jane Austen and Diversity for Persuasion's last summer. Our piece was Avoiding Racism, Race and Representation in Austen-Inspired Games, and that avoiding is in scare quotes. Um, we talk a lot about the ways in which, largely speaking, and you can see my work elsewhere about this as well, 
Austin games are overwhelmingly white with very few options for customization. Uh, the most famous Austin game, the massively multiplayer online role-playing game, Everchain, allows you to uh, change the color of your dress, but not your skin, hair, eyes, etc. And of course, it shut down for lack of funding before any such kinds of um, add-ons could be created. And that's kind of the story of Austin games that we're going to be talking about in the not too distant future. Uh, and so that this piece introduces, which is diversity either of sexuality or race or other kinds of human difference is often put off as like a later phase project that never happens because there's never funding. The one exception, uh, and this is um, even more than mine, it is Emily's obsession, um, is the work of Spiral Atlas, an indie designer based in Australia who has done one and a half adaptations of Austin's novels into game form. We took a look earlier this semester at Pride or Prejudice, which is about 15 chapters in and on indefinite hiatus, which has a wide variety of customizable options, including having one or more of your main characters, what we might say hero and heroine, uh, Spiral Atlas refers to them as lead and co-lead because they are uh, capacious in gender possibilities and orientation possibilities, but um, one or both of them could be wheelchair users, among other things. In their first game, uh, Northanger Abbey, which we took a look at today, and yesterday and this week, you get the idea. Um, there's a little less customizability. It's an earlier game. Um, Pride or Prejudice is responding to audience excitement. Um, but we still do see some interesting moves around race. And as uh, Dr. Kugler ref uh, kind of drew our attention to, it takes the text of Austin quite explicitly and directly and thinks about how the text transforms if we think about it um, without presuming whiteness. And so what is really fascinating is the first description of Catherine Moreland is identical in the game to the text of the novel, but the game reframes Catherine or Kit, depending on how you select their gender identity between male, female, and non-binary, um, is functionally depicted as East Asian. Um, there's a lot of East Asian notes in the kind of background of the game. There's a lot of chinoiserie, as Emily has noted. Um, and then she encounters the Tilneys, which also can be gender swapped as desired, um, who are notably brown, um, you know, dark skin, dark hair, um, not explicitly stated as such, but they're um, they are visibly non-white or at least non-pasty British white. Um, and so while not customizable, there's this, and we see in this game, this like initial attempt at not only doing the diversity of gender and sexuality, but also trying to make the game look more diverse, um, kind of on its face, so to speak. It's a really interesting exercise in walking through and exploring the novel as a series of contingent possibilities. Um, you can pursue either of the siblings um, as, uh, as the central character, um, but it really is the kind of reframing visually that's the most striking. So we talked a little bit about that and we talked a little bit about the kind of process of writing the article um, and then because we're writing the article in 2020 um, in the moment of um, Black Lives Matter and the both attempts and failed attempts at diversity, equity, inclusion that different institutions um, brought to the table. And so we had a candid conversation about the navigation and challenges of moving through spaces that are making attempts and those attempts are not always working or not always working in the way that you want them to. And how do, how does one keep accountable, um, you know, and in right relation and trying to 
trying to write in community. So these are all some of the things that we talked about. It's a little uh, unusual uh, because of Emily's availability that we front loaded that uh, material and then took a late break um, to, and then kind of came back to thinking about the novel more directly. But it was so it was a wide ranging conversation that touched on a variety of different moments in the text, um, which was very cool. Um, and thinking about the ways in which Henry is often, you know, speaking authoritatively about current events, but uh, different critics that have said, well, no, there, there, riots were actually a possibility, you know, and, you know, what does it mean to say this is England and, you know, we are a nation of voluntary spies and, and all of those sorts of things. And is Henry White right? And does Austin, is Austin as narrator positioning Henry as right? Um, and as with many things, it's more ambiguous than um, we often give her credit for when we flatten out these things into adaptations um, that are romance plots. Um, the rom romance is so, um, I don't want to say secondary, but it is, it is the, it feel, it sometimes feels like the required through line that Austin is providing nuance to. One wonders what Austin would be writing these days. I don't know. Um, the other thing I drew attention to is the ways in which, um, and this is always interesting when you have your close friend in the room talking about these things, is the ways in which friendship is imagined in this novel. Um, because we have, in the same way that we have two male figures, the more compelling in some ways, um, emotional or the most intense emotional uh, connection is between um, Isabella and uh, and Catherine or at least you know that's the moment that's the intense emotional engagement that we hear the most about more than anything else um, it's not necessarily that Eleanor is a fully developed alternate option although it would be interesting to think about a novel in which that was the case and this is where Spiral Atlas I think um, is useful um, but it is a interesting note that Eleanor's marriage is one of the prime movers that gets, uh, Catherine Moreland's ending kind of engaged, so to speak. Um, if Isabella is the thwarter, Eleanor is the facilitator. Um, and really, I mean, that's real friendship in a lot of ways, um, I carried this through as I pointed students to our last uh, published novel by Austin for next week. And I asked them to consider persuasion as a novel, not only about love and loss and distance and all of those sorts of things, but also about these non-blood affective ties and particular friendship, um, the ways that friendship moves people I think is present in Northanger Abbey is uh, we've already seen it in Emma and we're gonna see it in a slightly different way in these in the way that Austin novels are refracting um, when we get to persuasion. I also drew their attention to this week's A Court of Fay and Flowers the Dimension 20 Regency and Austin inspired game uh, that is still ongoing. It's going to have 10 episodes. And after it's over, we're going to discuss it in total. Um, I'm hoping students are keeping up, but to give them a kind of a little bit of an out, I said chapter eight, episode eight is going to be of particular interest. And I tell that to you as well. Um, it spends the first half in the epistolary mode and it is very resonant with the kind of feel of persuasion, which I think is really interesting. So, and it is of course always fun to talk about how letters do and don't go astray, but maybe that's a different video. One more video to record this week and I'll be catching up with the backlog. So hopefully you will see this uh, not too long after it is recorded. Take care.